The Middle East, as all of you know, has interests which are varying kinds to the United States. Uh, our policies have been aimed at stability in that region, which we've pursued, I think, with diligence, but mixed results. And in all the things that are uncertain about the Middle East, and you know there are many, one thing is clear, and that is that the Syrian Arab Republic is most important to stability in that region. And therefore, we're absolutely delighted to have the representative of that state join us this evening uh, to discuss the Middle East stability and Syrian-American relations. Dr. Jujadi is a distinguished scholar diplomat. He's held, held important posts in the Syrian Foreign Ministry. He served in London, Madrid, New York with the United Nations, and in Washington. He's held senior positions in Damascus, heading up numerous of the most important agencies there. He's received several honors uh, of, of great note, and perhaps as interesting as anything is the background which he brings to his job, which is the combination of scholarship and statesmanship. Just very quickly, to indicate the scope of, of his interests, uh, I'll read just the, the titles of a couple of the articles which he's written. The role of pre-Islamic poetry in the revival of literary Arab heritage. On one hand, international politics between idealism and real politique on the other. Art and expression, detente and international relations. And I could go on with these contrasts, which make the ambassador all the more fascinating to us. We're delighted to have the senior representative from Syria. We're especially pleased that is Dr. Jujanti, of course. We look forward with a great deal of interest uh, in this presentation. We value enormously the role of Syria in the Middle East, and we wish her well, and we wish her, of course, all the wisdom which is in such sort, short supply for most people most of the time. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to introduce the Ambassador of Syria to the United States, Dr. Rafik Pujadi. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Executive Director, you are going to embarrass me so many nice words. I do not know whether I would live up to the expectation. If I am so moved by your introduction, you would uh, excuse me. These are human feelings, and you know my poetic side. Perhaps, uh, <laughs> perhaps my talk would not be all that interesting, so let us leave poetry for the questions. <laughs> and then we will have a parallel, uh, balanced uh, parallel. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Thank you very much for inviting me to speak and for assembling such uh, distinguished audience from the little talks I had with uh, some of them. It shows how uh, your council is really, really distinguished and we are all proud of your efforts and of their participation. Uh, and I have today the, uh, this uh, opportunity uh, before this eminent council uh, to give this address, brief address, about the attitudes and the policies of my country uh, regarding the crisis of the Middle East. Some mise au point, as they say in French, mise au point, some precisions, are the more necessary that here and there the Syrian position is sometimes either misunderstood or sometimes, unfortunately, deliberately distorted. Nevertheless, by now there has developed a general acknowledgement that Syrian views on the peace process cannot be dismissed outright in as far as they invoke fundamental principles of international law, in as far as they stem from solid historic experience and evolution, they ought, we believe, to command attention and some consideration. 
First, we believe the roots of the crisis lies in the eviction of a part of the Palestinian people from their homeland and the continued denial of their right to self-determination to the Arab Palestinians in the occupied territories of the West Bank and Gaza. This fundamental problem remains up to now, unfortunately, sadly, very acute. It grows every day in complexity, coupled with the increasing despair and alienation of the Palestinian people. Even the narrow concept of autonomy alluded to in the Camp David agreements was interpreted by the Israeli government then in such a narrow way that emptied it from any meaningful content. And that, as you know, has driven the Egyptian negotiating, negotiating partner whose conclusion of unilateral peace treaty had met with the objection of the majority of the Arab states then, it has driven even the Egyptian delegation to utter despair and brought the Israeli-Egyptian negotiation with the participation of the United States to a dead end. Second, the sequence marked by the Israeli-Arab conflict over the rights of the Palestinian people resulted in the occupation of Sinai that was restituted later to Egypt but at the price of a serious division of Arab solidarity. The West Bank and Gaza were feverish construction of settlements by Israel is proceeding ahead in spite of its violation to international law and the Geneva Conventions that govern the rules of occupation and the will of the international community. And then the Golan Heights, which was later annexed by Israel, while by unanimous resolution of the international community, this act was declared illegal, null and void. Syria is firm in her conviction that the principle of the inadmissibility of acquiring territory by force remains at the basis of the UN Charter that was created to eliminate the scourge of war, to recognize equal sovereignty for peoples, and to make it absolutely necessary to respect the territorial integrity of states. Therefore, no compromise over sovereign right is admissible. International jurisprudence has sufficiently developed to secure the consent of parties in conflict to mutual security arrangements, buffer zones, monitoring by the UN forces, reduction of armaments in the proximity of the borders from one side and the other, disengagement of forces in conflict, in such UN peacekeeping tasks, Syria does not shun any flexibility, any co cooperation, but to admit that force can establish a fait accompli and lead to conquest and acquisition of territory, apart from condoning the injustice and the atrocities it inflicts upon peoples is to undermine the basic structure 
of international relations. Third, a just settlement is a settlement that redresses the grievances of any party, of every party without exception, on the basis of the rules of law and the resolutions of the international community. The widened dispute has assumed, unfortunately, the dimension of, Arab -Israeli, of an Arab-Israeli conflict at large. Accordingly, we believe a lasting settlement requires necessarily a comprehensive process. The step-by-step -step approach has but one motto, to liquidate the Palestinian cause by degrees, to impose on a single partner solutions of duress that are not compatible with the sovereign rights of nations, and to seek the weakening of Arab nationhood by dividing Arab ranks. The sense of a globality and balance prevailed once upon a time <laughs> upon the protagonist of Security Council Resolution 338, if you remember the provisions of these resolutions, which put an end, if you remember, to the war of 1973. Who were these protagonists? Mm -hmm. None other than the U.S. and the U.S.S.R. for the first time in the history of the United Nations in a major crisis of this magnitude, magnitude, the two superpowers agreed to sponsor the same resolution, 338, that called for negotiation and established, as you remember, under appropriate auspices and within the framework of the United Nations, the International Conference of Geneva. The conference approved the disengagement agreements and paved the way for a fruitful process. It is again here, while the recall of the conference was maturing, the step-by-step -step approach set in to derail this course, to derail the course of the International Conference. It is we believe about time to reinvigorate the comprehensive global process where every party participates, every party lays down its claims, its grievances, the all prevalent aim being to establish peace, just comprehensive lasting and justice on the basis of UN resolutions, all UN resolutions relevant to the crisis. Fourth point. Again, it is the unanimous international resolution, apart from the rules of international law, that require Israel to withdraw from Lebanon which she invaded in June 1982. While the Security Council resolutions are unanimously adopted to require to enjoin Israel to withdraw from Lebanon forthwith, Resolution 508, Resolution 509, and not by faces, some politicians in prominent legislative positions go around declaring to the news media at their leisurely encounters that it is Syria that constitutes the obstacle to that withdrawal. Uh, their bias here, I'm sorry to say, approaches the domain of ridicule. Syria is preventing Israel from withdrawing from Lebanon. 
if through this assertion they want to invoke the concept of the simultaneity of withdrawal of Israeli and Syrian forces, the question which we must pose is this, whether it is not high time to realize that the two withdrawals have no connection whatsoever. Withdrawal of the Syrian forces whose pre presence was originally requested by the Lebanese authorities and people to aid to stop the bloodshed, to aid to stop the civil strife, an intervention which prevented massacres on the largest and the most unpredictable scale to occur, is tied, such withdrawal is tied to the achievement of goals that have no similarity with invasion. Syria is working hard to help strengthening the national government, achieve reconciliation among the Lebanese and equilibrium, help the central authority extend its control to the whole of Lebanese territory through an army which is restructured, which is balanced, and thus becomes a national army. The objectives of the Syrian mandate are to help Lebanon remake its unity, strengthen its independence, and restore its sovereignty. There need be no effort, no negotiation, no decision on Syrian withdrawal when these goals are achieved even at a minimum. And the Syrian forces will withdraw overnight. And Syria and Lebanon, as independent and sovereign countries, two countries, two independent and sovereign, shall continue to have the same intimate links of geography, demography, common interest, economic and cultural and strategic ties. Dismemberment of Lebanon is a prescription, my friends, to infinite war and conflict. It is a direct threat to the very survival of Syria. This might be an obsession by the Syrians, but they believe in it. It might be an obsession. And a great peril, the dismemberment of Lebanon is a great peril in the path of Arab nationhood. Never did Syria, nor did Lebanon, never, never, never object to use the auspices of the UN and its machinery to bolster the security of the international border. The Lebanese government cannot be blamed if it rejects outright any notion of a dual army, one national and another non-national. This would transform Lebanese sovereignty into a myth. It is not Syria which is the obstacle to accepting such an entity. It is just it, justice, right, and common sense that reject such notions which are relevant to the age of colonialism but not are not relevant to modern times nor six point nor did syria contribute an inch to the iraqi iranian war it condemned this war from the very first hours did its possible to mediate from the start and her good offices as well as the good offices of some Arab countries prominent among which was the Kuwaiti mediation were then rejected. They were called betrayal of the Arab cause. Syria's sympathy with the aims of the Iranian revolution 
that promise to help the Arab-Palestinian cause should not be construed as a military alliance of any sort. The Syrian contacts with the government of Iran, sustained contact, silent contacts, non-publicized, have revealed that Iran is ready at last. It, it had so many conditions with Syrian mediation. It had uh, their, uh, its conditions have boiled down to its readiness to negotiate, but not with those who unleashed, in her opinion, an unjustifiable war with the avowed purpose of dismembering Iran. They would not negotiate with them, no matter what kind of mediation you can advance. Syria continue to believe this war is senseless. It is wasting energies and potential. It destroys innocent human beings on one part and the other. It de devastates properties. And Syria does not despair to do its utmost to help in the efforts to bring it to an end. It had a measured success indeed in helping prevent the extension of this deadly war to the whole Gulf. It got from Iran the assurances of respect of their, of the Gulf states' territorial integrity without any shadow of doubt. The last point, to, vil to vilify the stand of Syria, her detractors claim that she is the surrogate of a superpower because she buys armaments from her. Perhaps the wish of these advocates is uh, to see Syria defenseless. It uh, faces a state equipped to the teeth by the most sophisticated equipment. She is denied self-defense arms or equipment by the West. If she resorts to the Soviet Union, she has become surrogate. So what she should do to defend herself, uh, equip herself with flowers from France and perfume from, from Italy? Uh, those who blame Syria without uh, going, uh, some of them are, uh, uh, are respectable people, but who do not see the predicament of Syria. But it seems to me every time I uh, uh, listen to uh, such uh, casual talk. I remember a poet, and since you mentioned poetry, if I don't cite a verse, they would say, where is poetry? All this is rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> he said, the, the verse, Alqahu fil yammi, maktufan. There are many of my Jewish friends who speak Arabic who understand me. They might applaud now. Alqahu fil yammi maktufan. وقال له إياك إياك أن تبتل بالماء A friend threw his friends into waters, into the waters of the ocean. He tied his hands and he said, be careful, don't let yourself be wet by the waters of the ocean. So Syria, if it acquired arms, it is surrogate. Had she ever refused American equipment for her self-defense? Well, Mr. Chairman, I might not be very eloquent, I might not be lengthy, but I thought these uh, points are recurrent, and I had my contribution, I might have my shortcomings, and I'm open to any fair questions, but thank you very much for having the patience and the generosity of arranging this big affair to meet our friends all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Under what conditions would normalization of relations between Syria and Israel take place? An international, uh, an international conference having all parties, no matter how uh, lengthy it is, and having its terms of reference, no violation of frontiers, no annexation, no occupation, 
autonomy for the Palestinian people under UN auspices, according to the norms of international law like any other people in the world, nothing, nothing distinct, would uh, pave the ground for peaceful relations and for respect of every other's territory. And from then, nobody could stop trade and communication and cooperation and progress and each country uh, benefits from the talents of the other. The other would benefit from its resources and the region would be a paradise again and that is not, uh, that is not an exaggeration. It is uh, a land of uh, honey and milk. It is, but we need water. <laughs> what initiatives has Syria taken uh, for direct negotiations with Israel, A, and B, uh, would you comment upon the condition of 4,000 Jews in Syria? We have uh, always uh, insisted on a global process, lest this step-by-step -step approach lead to the division of the Arab countries and lead to such agreement as Your Excellency who seem to know the facts very well, know about the 17 May ag Agreement, which was imposed on Lebanon by the force uh, of tanks. We do not want such agreements. We want agreements uh, fair to Israel, fair to Syria, fair to the Palestinians, to Egypt, to Lebanon, to the whole region, because our perspective is a perspective of cooperation. We will never make a, an approach of step by step. The question is born in the UN. The UN, the UN is the embodiment of the international community, and to invoke the auspices of the UN is not a crime. It is attachment to justice. As for my uh, president, and you say he killed uh, 10,000 uh, people, if uh, you have uh, witnessed through more than five years the assassination by terrorists of the best Syrian professors, of the best officers, of the best workers for communities. If you have witnessed the traps which your Marines have witnessed, stationed in recruiting stations, killing in one instance 500 people, and then all these terrorist acts are culminating in the upheaval of Hamas, which they fabricated, and they were uh, they were expecting all towns to rise, then you would understand that in the last resort, any government would have to defend itself. What about fundamentalists uh, and fanatics if they are armed to the teeth and they attack the White House? What would, would you call uh, the army who <coughs> needs them a dictator? It seems that you are not familiar with the, uh, with the developments now that you are very, very pronounced on terrorism. I wish you would understand a little bit the predicament which Syria passed through for uh, many years. But it seems you have uh, uh, you have uh, two measures and two balances. That is how I doubt the objectivity of your statements. Yes, sir. The question is whether the uh, uh, attack upon the new state of Israel by her neighbors is part of the uh, Palestinian problem. Uh, sir, if you read the uh, memoirs of Begin, you see that the facts are otherwise. There were uh, massacres against the Arab villages, and there were attempts which he describes to change the uh, uh, map put by the United Nations, which prompted the Arabs on this attack to help their brothers. The question was, uh, indeed, is Syria prepared to recognize Israel and negotiate with her? You uh, find in the phase agreement the mutual recognition of all uh, states of the area, of all states, the non-violation of the territory, the uh, respect of all uh, their sovereign rights, their security within their frontiers, and that resolution is uh, unanimously adopted. The question is, can you reconcile the talk of nonviolence and non-aggression with Syrian attacks upon Israel in the past? 
I told you in 1948, and some people, of course, laughed at the books of uh, Ben Gurion, who was uh, president of one of these uh, uh, associations, let us say, uh, speaks uh, aloud. There were uh, massacres perpetrated like Der Yassin, if you remember, against the Palestinian people. That is what prompted uh, the Arab armies, whether they liked it or not, to intervene. In Okay, you may think so. I advise you to go to Begin. You are saying Begin is liar, not me. Uh, in 1967, we were in alliance with uh, Egypt. Egypt, uh, uh, an aggression was launched on Egypt. You know the planes which attacked the uh, airport, and we were uh, finding ourselves in the war. In 1973, we were liberating our Golan. Liberation of the territory is not an aggression. This is the jurisprudence of the UN. The, the question is, how does Syria define the distinction between Jewry in general and Zionism in particular? We think uh, uh, we have lived with uh, our cousins or our brothers, uh, the Jews, for centuries without uh, any incident. Uh, Zionism seemingly has uh, ambitions over uh, territory. It has a policy of expansion. It wants to do away with the Palestinian people. That is why we are against, uh, against this policy of expansion. But as individuals, why, why should we hate anybody if they do not aggress uh, your rights, your uh, livelihood, your sovereignty, and your people? The question is, would, would Syria work to uh, prevent terrorists from coming into Israel from southern Lebanon? if it were within her, her power to do so. We assured uh, the American emissaries that we have encouraged the government of Lebanon to envisage security arrangements, that we would uh, give them any uh, help they require. It is up to the Lebanese to discuss these security arrangements. But of course, uh, Lebanon would not accept uh, the imposition of conditions which stifle its uh, sovereignty. There should be in the eyes of Lebanon. There should be no dual army owing its allegiance elsewhere. But uh, Lebanon agrees to the extension of the mandate of the UN forces, to the strengthening of their equipment, to, uh, uh, to strengthen their mandate and to, uh, to increase their number, and to have a deployment which uh, will uh, comprise the whole a frontier zone where fear of infiltration uh, is, and uh, every uh, government would cooperate with that scheme, and that scheme is before the uh, administration now. Yes, sir. Mr. Ambassador, as a follow-up to that question, why should Israel entrust her future security to the United Nations when in 1967 the United Nations withdrew from the area to the uh, question is, in light of, uh, uh, is, would it be wise for, in your view, for Israel to commit its future safety to the United Nations? Uh, the difference uh, is that the mandate is obligatory now, and all states uh, undertake not to repeal the forces. It is a forces of its own not dependent on the will and the whims of the states. Why is uh, Syria reluctant to absorb some Palestinians into Syrian life in general? Syria uh, gives the Palestinians their right to employment, their right to equal treatment. Uh, it is they who insist on their nationality. They do not like uh, to be absorbed. They call us traitors if we do anything which denotes their uh, absorption. Who was this Palestinian who complained to you that he is not absorbed? In what condition was he? We defend, uh, we have in our uh, monthly salaries a, a, a chapter deducting our salaries. Ask my, uh, my counselor what is our salary because of 
the help and support we give to the Palestinians in Syria, to the refugees. How is it? What did he complain of? Where was he discriminated against? And what is his name? We, 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 have, we have time for only one more question. The, ambas the ambassador has been uh, traveling for five days, and he just got off a plane this afternoon. And uh, so we'll have one question uh, only remaining. Uh, this gentleman has been which waiting long. Ah, right here. It's yes, not sir. fair. Yeah. Yes. I have seen you waiting. According to reports, Israel is planning to withdraw from Lebanon. What is Syria's position vis-a-vis -vis Lebanon and vis-a-vis -vis Israel if this withdrawal actually, in fact, does occur? This withdrawal will ameliorate very, very much the situation in Lebanon. It will satisfy this community of the South so that there would, they would not be face the big danger. Thank you very much for a wonderful question. That is a question. That's a question. <laughs> They are on the verge of radicalization and growing mad with this occupation, with the cutting of their livelihood. If there is a withdrawal and the Shiite community with all other communities uh, uh, affiliate to the central government, then it would be good for Syria, it would be good for Lebanon, and it would be good for uh, Israel to save all uh, uh, these lives. This is a very, very welcome approach, but under fair condition, not by another accord of imposition. Thank you very much. Mr. Ambassador, we appreciate very much that you have joined us this evening, especially given your extraordinarily busy schedule. And uh, we know the last few days have been very, very difficult for you. We're delighted that you've been with us. Uh, we've had a chance to get a good look, I think, at the uh, Syrian position. Uh, we wish you well, and thank you very much. Thank you.